Welcome back to our course, Fundamentals of Operating Systems, based on the textbook Operating System Concepts, 10th edition by Silbershots, Gagne, and Galvin. In the last couple of units, we have been talking about synchronization between processes sharing a critical section, possibly using multiple processors. We examined providing mutual exclusion using hardware solutions like test and set and software solutions such as mutex locks and semaphores. We learned about the most common problems regarding the issue of synchronization, such as the bounded buffer problem, the reader-writer problem, and the dining philosopher's problem. Now we will proceed with the discussion of the villain that the solutions to all these problems are trying to avoid, deadlocks. So let's start Unit 8. In a multi-programming environment, several threads may compete for a finite number of resources. A thread requests resources. If the resources are not available at that time, the thread enters a wait state. Sometimes a wait thread can never again change state because the resources it has requested are held by other waiting threads. This situation is called a deadlock. We discussed this issue briefly in Unit 6 as a form of aliveness failure. There we define deadlock as a situation in which every process in a set of processes is waiting for an event that can be caused only by another process in the set. In this unit, we discuss methods that application developers as well as operating system programmers can use to prevent or deal with deadlocks. Although some applications can identify programs that may be deadlocked, Operating systems typically do not provide deadlock prevention facilities, and so it is the responsibility of the programmers to ensure that they design the deadlock-free programs. Deadlock problems, as well as other liveness failures, are becoming more challenging as demand continues for increased concurrency and parallelism on multi-core systems. A system consist of a finite number of resources to be distributed among a number of competing threads. The resources may be partitioned into several types, each consisting of some number of identical instances. Computer cycles, files and input-output devices are examples of resource types. If a system has four CPUs, for example, then the resource type CPU has four instances. Also, the resource type network may have two instances. If a thread requests an instance of a resource type, the allocation of any instance of that type should satisfy the request. If it does not, then the instances are not identical and the resource type classes have not been clearly defined. The various synchronization tools we've already discussed, such as mutex locks and semaphores, are also system resources. And on modern computer systems, these tools are the most common sources of deadlock. A lock is usually associated with a specific data structure. That is, one lock may be used to protect access to a queue another to protect access to a linked list, and so on. For that reason, each instance of a lock is typically assigned its own resource class. A thread must request a resource before using it and must release the resource after using it. This is the same stuff we've talked about previously. A thread may request as many resources as it needs to carry out its designated task. Obviously, the number of resources requested may not be greater than the total number of resources available on the system. In other words, a thread cannot request two network interfaces if the system only has one. Under normal mode of operation, a thread may utilize a resource only in the following sequence. A request 
a thread requests a resource. If the request cannot be granted immediately, as we have already studied, like in the case of a mutex lock that's currently being held by another thread, then the requesting thread must wait until it can acquire the resource. Use is next. The thread can operate on the resource. For example, if the resource is a mutex lock, the thread can access its critical section. And then release. A thread releases the resource. The request and release of resources may be system calls. Examples of system calls are the request and release of a device, or the open and close of a file, and then there's the allocate and free memory system calls. Also, as we saw in the first synchronization unit, request and release can be accomplished through the wait and signal operations on semaphores and through the acquire and release operations of a mutex lock. For each use of a kernel resource by a thread, the operating system checks to make sure that the thread is requested and has been allocated the resource. A system table records whether each resource is free or allocated. For each resource that is allocated, the table also records the thread to which it's been allocated. If a thread requests a resource that is currently allocated to another thread, it can be added to the queue of threads waiting for this resource. Boy, I sure hope by this point you're catching on to this idea of the state of a process, ready, waiting, and so forth. Because we have repeated and repeated in the different units those same issues. A set of threads is in a deadlock state when every thread in the set is waiting for an event that can be caused only by another thread in the set. The events that we're most concerned with here are the resource acquisition and release. The resources are typically logical, such as mutex locks, semaphores, and files. However, other types of events may result in deadlocks, including reading from a network interface or the IPC facilities, the inner process communication facilities. To illustrate a deadlock state, let's look back to the original dining philosophers problem that we had in a previous unit. In this situation, resources are represented by those chopsticks, remember? If all the philosophers get hungry at the same time and each philosopher grabs the chopstick on her left, then there are no longer any available chopsticks. Each philosopher is then blocked, waiting for her right chopstick to become available, which it never will. Developers of multi-threaded applications must remain aware of the possibility of deadlocks. The locking tools we discussed, test and set, mutex lock, semaphores, and so on, are designed to avoid race conditions. However, in using these tools, developers must pay careful attention to how locks are acquired and released, otherwise deadlock can occur. Live lock is another form of a liveness failure. It's similar to deadlock in that both prevent two or more threads from proceeding, but the threads are unable to proceed for different reasons. Whereas deadlock occurs when every thread in a set is blocked waiting for an event that can be caused only by another thread in the set, live lock occurs when a thread continuously attempts an action that fails. Live lock is similar to what sometimes happens when two people attempt to pass in a hallway. One moves to his right, the other moves to her left, and they're still obstructing each other. Then the first one moves to his left, and the other one moves to her right, and they're still in, uh, obstructing each other. They aren't blocked, but they aren't making any progress either. Live lock typically occurs when threads retry failing operations at the same time. It can be generally avoided by having each thread retry the failing operation at random times. This is exactly the approach taken by Ethernet networks when a network collision occurs. If you took my networking class, you probably remember this. 
rather than trying to retransmit a packet immediately after a collision occurs, a host involved in a collision will back off a random period of time before attempting to transmit again. Live lock is less common than deadlock, but it's still a challenging issue in designing concurrent applications and, like deadlock, it may only occur under specific scheduling circumstances. Why don't we take a break right here? We've already gone on a little bit longer than I usually like in one of these lessons. So just take a time now to update your study guide and take care of any other business you have to take care of. And when you're ready, come on back and we'll continue our discussion of the problem of deadlock.